Morning, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for inviting me here. Good to see you too, Tom, the peripatetic Tom Putnam. <laughs> Cover a lot of territory. People seem to think it's strange that um, I should write biographies of Ronald Reagan, Beethoven, and Edison, but their common attribute is obvious. They were all deaf. <laughs> The first time I addressed the subject of Ronald Reagan and the Cold War on stage before a think tank audience in Washington in the mid-1990s, I made a risky rhetorical experiment. As part of my biographical effort to get into the president's skin, I transcribed my speech onto one of the pocket-sized cards that he used to use. And I also tried to imitate his characteristic abbreviations. Reagan could take one of these cards, look at it, photograph it in his head, and talk for 10 minutes. So I used um, his abbreviations, such as EC for economics, AC for arms control, and CW for the Cold War. <coughs> Unfortunately, as a writer, I had my own um, traditional abbreviations and in the heat of uh, the making the speech. I um, mistrans misspoke some of the abbreviations. My AC and CW are somewhat different from Reagan's. And after the speech was over, a puzzled academic came up and said, Mr. Morris, I didn't understand your argument that air conditioning was a major issue in this. <laughs> in the American Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> Memories of the days of the strategic, strategic Defense Initiative and the evil empire are getting dim. So much so that my wife was not surprised when she went to get her hair done recently and the stylist had never even heard of the Cold War and didn't even know who Ronald Reagan was. Sick transit gloria. Or to use a Latin epigram, perhaps more relevant to Reagan, si monumentum requiris circumspice. If you seek his monument, look around you. And when you do, it's the things that you don't see that most speak to his memory. Where's the Soviet Union? Where's the Berlin Wall? Where's the Warsaw Pact and the Stasi and the Securitat? Where are the Refuseniks? What happened to mutually assured destruction? Where are the ban the bombers and national malaise? All gone. Thanks to Ronald Reagan, the first commander in chief we've ever had who actually laughed at the Russian menace. And thanks too, to an even greater degree, to Mikhail Gorbachev, the last Soviet president, a sad, sick old man now, suffering the rejection and contempt that is the fate of all transitional leaders. It was the chemistry between these two men, meeting for the first time in Geneva 30 years ago, that began the Cold War thaw that eventually ended in a benign meltdown of the permafrost so long obtaining between East and West. One overexcited intellectual at the time called it the end of history. We all know that to the contrary, a new kind of ideological threat, less technological but much more barbarous even than that posed by Joseph Stalin, was being born in the Middle East as Gorbachev went into retirement. History does not end. As Claire Booth Luce used to say, it's one damn thing after another. <laughs> it does, however, mutate, and has done so at such a rate since 9-11 that you can't blame even retired hairdressers for forgetting how scared of nuclear war most of the human race was 
when Ronald Reagan became president on January the 20th, 1981. I said just now it was the things you don't see that memorialize his achievement, but there is one remarkably beautiful monument that you can see and touch and photograph your children in front of on the Pacific patio of the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California. It's a huge fragment of the Berlin Wall, gray and pitted with bullet holes on one side and spray painted with butterflies and other symbols of freedom on the other. In one respect, that chunk of concrete, to give you an idea of its size, it's almost as high as the stacked volumes of the United States Federal Income Tax Code. <laughs> in one respect, it looks incongruous, an ugly relic of the Democratic Demokratische, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, set against our own shining sea. But in another respect, it's very fragmentation. In the midst of an all-encompassing democracy, seems both moving and right. It brings to mind what Reagan said when he first looked at the Berlin Wall, a spontaneous remark I've always thought much more eloquent than that rather hokey, staged, Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall of June 1987. Six years earlier, after delivering his famous uh, Westminster Address to the British Parliament, President Reagan paid, his, uh, paid a quick visit to Berlin and was driven to Checkpoint Charlie for what was not only his first view of the war, but his first view of communism. I'll read you my description of his epiphany in Dutch. He stepped out of his limousine to see it better. To left and right stretched the wall, gray, slabby, pocked, barbed, spiked with gun towers, echoing somewhere down its double-layered length with the yowls of guard dogs. Sliced through by a single boomed road that disclosed streetscapes totally lacking in color, unless darker grays and gray-green trees and gray-brown apartment blocks were to be considered additions to the spectrum. East German soldiers with submachine guns stood in little knots around the guardhouses, looking expressionlessly back at him. A reporter asked the president what he thought of what he saw. Reagan gestured at the wall and said succinctly, it's as ugly as the idea behind it. Talking of walls and totalitarianism, there was another incident back in the days when Dutch Reagan was a student that demonstrated his weird ability to remember his own future. <coughs> in this case, actually reenacted. Edna St. Vincent Millay is not the first person who comes to mind in connection with Ronald Reagan. But on April 10th, 1930, when he was 19, he acted the role of Thyrsis in her anti-war play, Aria da Capo. It was this performance in a drama festival at, in Evanston, Illinois, that won him an award and um, prompted one of the judges to recommend that he consider taking up acting as a career. Aria de Capo was written in verse as an allegory of war, at a time when memories of Verdun and the Somme were still traumatic for millions. The plot was simple, even naive. Two ancient Greek shepherd boys get bored with tending their respective flocks in open country and they decide to play a game. One of them says, let's gather rocks and build a wall between us. It's really just a wall of colored crepe paper. But after it's built, they flop down on either side and survey the divided landscape. 
Then Corrindon, who was played in 1930 by Reagan's football buddy Enos Coe, Corrindon realizes that Thyrsus has a strategic advantage in the form of a large drinking bowl. It's one of the props on stage right. Oh, Thyrsus, just a minute, he says. All the water is on your side of the wall, and my sheep are thirsty. Thyrsus counters by pointing out that there's another prop in the form of some buried jewels on Corridan's side. They begin to quarrel about who deserves which asset. And their quarrel takes on a life of its own. It threatens to control them rather than they control it. One of us has to take a risk or else, says Corrindon. Oh, Thyrsus, now for the first time I see this wall is actually a wall, a thing come up between us, shutting me away from you. I do not know you anymore. You are a stranger. Well, to cut a long play short, they conclude a water for jewels treaty, but at the moment of exchange, their mutual hostility breaks out again, and they end up simultaneously killing each other. As they die, they realize that the war between them is really a vestigial thing, easily shattered and sundered. I think of Edna St. Vincent Millay's play whenever I look at that chunk of wall in Simi Valley, and I'm haunted by its title, Aria da Capo, the song that comes round again. The next time Reagan played the role of Thyrsus to Gorbachev's Corindon, Geneva in November 1985, they had to settle another quarrel that had taken on a life of its own and settle it peacefully, lest the nightmare of mutually assured destruction become real. They played the opening scene of the drama in Geneva and thank God changed the ending to a happy one at Reykjavik in October 1986. Ronald Reagan was not an intellectual, but he was gifted with extraordinary instincts. As you may know, in his youth he was a lifeguard on the Rock River in Illinois for seven successive summers and saved 77 lives. When he was losing it at the end of his life, about the last coherent sentence he was capable of coming out with was, I used to be a lifeguard on that river. I had a picture of it on the wall of his study. I saved 77 lives. I once said to him, Mr. President, I'd been reading Bertrand Russell's explication of the theory of relativity. I said, Mr. President, um, I don't know if you ever read about the theory of relativity, but it seems to me that you had it all figured out when you were a lifeguard. Um, you used to sit all day long on that rocking platform floating on the river, watching for people in distress. And when you saw somebody drowning, you threw off your spectacles, and you dived into the moving water, and you'd swam not toward the drowning person, but downstream of him, because you knew by the time you got there, <coughs> your parabola would intersect with his, and then you swam back to the diving platform, not toward it, but upriver, knowing again the parabola would bring you back to where you started. And in all this flux, with no vision, since your spectacles were off, you had no sense of stability, but you sensed the relative position from where you came. And Reagan said, yeah, in spring that river really used to run reef. <laughs> Just as that teenage lifeguard, mimed with his own strong body and sure instincts, the complexities of a theory he didn't need to read, so did the septuagenarian president negotiating arms control on our behalf with Mikhail Gorbachev, articulate a strategic defense initiative which did not have to be deployed to achieve its object, the power of SDI lay in its symbolic quality. 
It was a metaphor. Linguists tell us that since the dawn of human speech, which is and the same thing as since the dawn of diplomacy, the most powerful rhetorical images have always concerned weapons and technology. <coughs> David's sling and stone, Excalibur, brandished by the arm and white Samite, Schumann's guns buried in flowers, and so on. Here, suddenly bursting in the Geneva sky, like some collaborative extravaganza of God and Rube Goldberg, was a cosmos full of lethal lasers and silently streaming particle beams. Geosynchronous mirrors whose images would melt and kill. Sensors so preternaturally smart that they could distinguish between decoys disguised as warheads and warheads disguised as decoys. Not to mention a heaven-filling debris of balloons and umbrellas and radioactive chaff. No wonder Paul Gorby's birthmark throbbed. <laughs> because this heaven-filling fantasy, this war among the stars, was nothing less than an imaginative projection of American resolve. A resolve that mocked the very misgivings of the scientists, such as Edward Teller and others, already working on it. The SDI, moreover, was budgeted at 32 billion, just for starters. Any nation that could afford to contemplate a defensive, a defense so madly inventive and so madly expensive, equal if built to the cost of an entirely new US Navy, was clearly a nation able to bankrupt the Soviet Union's attempts at offensive countermeasures. Gorbachev knew that, and Reagan knew that he knew. But to paraphrase an old CIA joke, did Gorby know that Reagan knew that he knew? <laughs> and if so, did Reagan know that Gorbachev knew that he knew that he knew? The answer remained locked up in the deep underground silo, which was Ronald Reagan's heart. All I can tell you is that we, if I may include myself as an independent writer in the delegation um, at Geneva, all of us were seriously scared on the morning he was due to meet Gorbachev for the first time. In an attempted humor, we hung a sign on the overhang of the stairway at the Villa Palmetto as Reagan came down the stairs saying, Jerry Ford says, watch your head, Mr. President. <laughs> we all remember what a klutz Jerry Ford was. He laughed when he saw it. And he continued laughing all the way over to his motorcade. Ronald Reagan, cheerful personification of all that is naive, all that is optimistic in the American national character, drove off laughing to meet his counterpoint and we all, to a man and woman, relaxed. In order to emphasize the metaphorical effect of the SDI on Soviet arms control policy, I would refer you to an even more potent image that President Reagan promulgated in 1983, identifying Russia, or the motherland, as Lillian Hellman used to call it, as an evil empire. The length and breadth of American mass media, not to mention the rather more cramped length and breadth of American academe, guffawed at this crass alliteration, evil empire, and accused Reagan of being confrontational, bomb-happy, xenophobic, or worse. Well, it's funny how things change. During an international conference at the end of the Cold War uh, in 1995, the same one at which I articulated my theory about air conditioning, a Russian delegate confessed that it was that phrase, evil empire, 
That phrase, is officially enunciated by the President of the United States, that made the motherland realize almost in shock <coughs> that it was in fact evil, that communism went against nature and good sense, that it denied space for the human soul to expand and the human heart to express unfettered emotion, that Mr. Reagan had chosen his words only too well. So far, I've been talking about the older, more diplomatic Reagan, who decept whose deceptively gentle manner most of us remember. We tend to forget that when he was younger, in fact, even um, up to the time he ran for the presidency for the first time in 1976, his unsuccessful bid, he was then a hard, formidable man whose ideology was every bit as jagged as that chunk of Berlin Wall in Simi Valley. Considering how equally aggressive the then leader of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev was in the age of detente, we may thank the Republican Party for renominating President Ford, even though in doing so, it ensured the election of Jimmy Carter. Reagan, by the way, could be surprisingly um, contemptuous of anybody who ran against him or opposed him or whom he considered weak. He once said to me <coughs> about um, President Carter, he said, he's the only man who ever came into this place, the White House, and left it smaller. He um, sat next to LBJ Shortly after LBJ left the presidency, he was then governor of California, and uh, LBJ confessed to him that um, he said, uh, Ronnie, uh, I'm so glad to be out of the White House. There was not a night I went to bed when I didn't fear that while I was asleep, they were gonna start World War III. <coughs> and Reagan said to me with utter contempt, any man who's that fearful doesn't deserve to be president of the United States. His visceral hostility toward communism can be traced back to the days immediately after World War II, when as president of the Screen Actors Guild, he first encountered Marxist mendacity in the Crafts Union strike of 1946. One of the threats he received for pushing for a democratic solution was a telephone warning that unless he desisted, he would get acid thrown in his face. The kind of call an actor tends to remember. From then on, through the settlement of the strike, Reagan packed a pistol. And from then on, for the rest of his life, he was determined as Thomas Jefferson to oppose upon the altar of God any tyranny over the mind of man. His opposition to communism was actually not so much ideological as moral. He drew no distinction between it and Nazism, which he detested even before the war. I wish I had time to talk about the intensity of his feelings regarding the Holocaust, but it's outside the scope of this talk. Suffice to say, <coughs> The totalitarianism of any kind brought out the iron in his otherwise genial demeanor. If Reagan had been Thersis to Brezhnev's Corinden in 1977, instead of four years later when they were both older and wiser, the Cold War may well have become white hot. As it was, and even after his near death at the hands of John Hinckley in March 1981, Reagan retained enough hardness to break the PATCO air controller strike that August and send the leader of the union to jail. Governor John Walker correctly noted the other day, and by correctly I mean I think he read this in my book, that it was the sight of press photographs of the PATCO president in handcuffs, 
handcuffs, ironically authorized by the former president of the Screen Actors Guild, that persuaded the Soviet Politburo that Ronald Reagan was a man of unshakable moral convictions. This was two years before the climactic year of 1983 when Reagan, ignoring the recession that he had been inherited from President Carter, confronted Yuri Andropov's regime with three deliberately intimidating acts. The evil empire speech of March 8th, the um, SDI announcement of March 23rd, and the emplacement of intermediate range missiles in Western Europe in November of that year. Faced with such resolve, Andropov, who was then a dying man, elected not to respond militarily, but strategically. He chose as his successor the youngest, most intelligent, and most diplomatically adroit member of the Politburo, Mikhail Gorbachev. Knowing that Gorbachev was the only man in Moscow capable of handling Ronald Reagan. As a British observer once remarked to me, Gorby was the direct product of Ronald Reagan's will. As things turned out, Andropov's dying wish was not heeded by remnants of the Soviet old guard, and Gorbachev had to wait slightly more than a, a year while another walking corpse, Konstantin Chernenko, tried to hold the Soviet Union together. Which brings me to a personal anecdote that may be of some interest to you and um, is certainly relevant to the history of the Cold War. Dwayne Andreas, the agribusiness um, tycoon who ran Archer Daniels Midland in the 1980s, knew Gorbachev well. Gorbachev used to be agricultural minister of the Soviet Union. And Andreas told me that um, on a visit to the Soviet Union, Gorbachev, um, who, was not, who was, had just become a general secretary in 1985, received him for old time's sake, and they had a companionable chat together. And when Andreas got back to his hotel, um, he told me that um, there was a knock on the door from a KGB agent, and he was handed an envelope, an envelope with no comment, the man walked away, and when he opened the envelope, he found it was a memorandum from Gorbachev. An extraordinary document, which was a complete depiction and analysis of the technological and industrial desuetude of the Soviet Union in the early 1980s. Full of statistical and um, concrete information about how technologically backward the Soviet Union was at that time. It was the fruit of researchers that Gorbachev and Edward Shevardnadze, his future foreign minister, had accumulated in the late 1970s at the request of Yuri Andropov. They had secretly surveyed the whole state of the Soviet Union in the late eight, uh, 1970s when Reagan was campaigning for his first term. And this document, which Gorbachev sent to Andreas in 1985, was clearly intended as um, a private message to the President of the United States, since Gorbachev knew that Andreas and Reagan were old friends. He wished Ronald Reagan to know, secretly and privately, that his country was in a parlous state, and therefore not to push him too hard. Perhaps the least appreciated characteristic of Reagan was his imaginative nature. I spoke earlier of his, this mysterious gift he had, being able to remember his own future. For example, as a boy, he used to dream of living in a house with tall white columns and tall windows. <laughs> He repeatedly had that dream until he moved into it as president. He drew a self-portrait at the age of 17, a silhouette which I reproduced in Dutch, that is an uncanny 
portrait of the President of the United States with his pompadour and the massive desk and big body. 17, when he wrote it. And other uh, um, examples which I won't go into. Violet Bonham Carter, in her memoir of Winston Churchill, writes about imagination. She says, imagination, in truth, is but another name for power. Great leaders, the greatest leaders, have it. Julius Caesar had it, Napoleon, Lincoln, Disraeli, Churchill, de Gaulle. Toward the end of de Gaulle's life, he was proposing to write a book of dialogues between himself and all the great leaders of the past. I wouldn't put Reagan quite in the company of those statesmen I've mentioned, although, believe it or not, de Gaulle once pursued Governor Reagan down the aisle of Washington National Cathedral just to shake his hand. The power of his imagination derived from its intensity rather than its originality, which is to say, from his belief in belief. It was that power, as well as his obvious, almost naive good nature, that prevailed upon Gorbachev at Geneva and at Reykjavik. And the rest, as historians say, is history. Thank you. Both of our keynote speakers, Anne and Edmund, have agreed to take questions. So we have a few minutes if people want to pose questions to either Anne or Edmund. Okay, now, now that we have somebody asking a question. <laughs> Come on up. Mind that down. Hi, uh, this was tremendous, by the way. It was really, really good. Uh, Ed, I have your voice in my ear because I listen to Dutch in my car and my commute, uh, and uh, it's fascinating to hear you talk. But my question is this. Given what's going on right now with Putin and the, um, you know, the strategy that we see unfolding between the West and uh, Putin, um, how would you, if, if, if you were asked for advice from the U.S. government as to how to deal with that situation. What insights would you, would you give them? And I think you should answer that. No. <laughs> you don't want to offer the U.S. government advice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the fortunate position of writing about this all the time. And, uh, I do say that I think. Um, you know, what, what we're seeing in Russia is really the, it's the return of I mean, it's not, just a, it's not just a revived version of the Soviet Union. It's, it's sort of Soviet people who have re... Oh, you want me to talk in the microphone? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the nature of the, of the Russian state now is that it's run by a, a KGB clique, which um, took its money out of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, recycled it, brought it back in, enriched itself, and came back to power. So in, in, it has, it's not just, it's not the same system as in the past, but it has very clear links to it and a very uh, clear connection to it. Um, when, the, when the invasion of Crimea began, um, as you may remember, there were these unmarked sold, you know, soldiers without uniforms walking all over the peninsula, and people were saying, what could this possibly be? What's going on? What's happening? I thought I knew exactly what it was. Uh, because it's exactly how the occupation of Poland and the creation of a Polish uh, communist state occurred in 1944 and 45. They, you know, the NKVD came in in unmarked uniforms, recreated a, a secret police force, and, and piece by piece took over the country. That's exactly what happened. So it's a kind of KGB playbook. Um, fi you know, fighting, fighting it requires some lessons from the Cold War. Um, you know, at the main lesson being understanding what it is and what is the nature of the system and not to imagine that Russia is some kind of degenerate Western state and if we're only really nice to them, then they'll become more Western. But to understand that it really is quite a different political system. You know, you have in the hands of a few, very tiny group of people, you have not only the president, but the equivalent of the president of Exxon, the owner of Time Life, the owner of the New York Times and the secret police all within one, one institution of the president's office. 
Um, and to, to, to have an idea that this is somehow, we can deal with this as a Western country is wrong. Um, my, my advice in terms of Russian action in Ukraine is to focus harder on Ukraine itself, because in many ways the reconstruction of the success of Ukraine, um, if Ukraine becomes even a remotely prosperous and democratic country, then it will stand as a, uh, um, as, as a, as a, as a symbol of Russia, of, of what this, um, I don't want to call it an evil empire, but what this really very, this mafia state was unable to achieve. So I would focus Western attention, not just on arming the Ukrainians, which is maybe going to work or maybe not, but on a deeper strategy of, of in reinforcing democracy and, and uh, rule of law in Ukraine and establishing it as a, um, as a, I don't really care whether it's part of NATO or part of the EU, but as a, as a, as a Western state with a Western ideology. And that would be the best response to Russia. Uh, uh, before too long. We, before yeah. we take another question, can I ask you one quick one arising out of what? It's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> out of what you just said, why did Khrushchev give um, the Crimea back to Ukraine? I believe the world authority on Khrushchev is in the room. Where is William <laughs> Taubman? I'm gonna, I'm not, I, I know what I think happened, but maybe he wants to answer. This is Khrushchev's biographer, right. who um, is 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 actually the top expert, but maybe he wants to say. I mean, I think the main reason is because it's logically, it's connected to Ukraine. I mean, if you look at a map, yeah. Crimea is part of Ukraine, not Russia. What, what, what Professor Taubman, <laughs> who's speaking in a minute. Actually, of, 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 all, of all the things about Khrushchev that I know and don't know, I know least about this. Is, <laughs> nobody, nobody cared about this at all I, until, I, I until I a month or two. about that because of the time I wrote the book, I thought the issue was dead, never to be revived. Now that it's revived, I've looked at it again. I think part of the reason is right geographical. It's right there. It looks as if it ought to belong to Ukraine. I think it also has something to do with the fact that after the war, uh, they and after they had exiled the Crimean Tatars to Central Asia, they needed Ukrainian peasants. Yeah, to repopulate to it. Agriculture. Yeah. And then most speculative, but quite possibly true, it's possible that Gorbachev had a, uh, that Khrushchev Khrush had a bit of a guilty conscience. About Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He'd been the head of Ukraine during the terrible purges, and he'd grown up very close to Ukraine and climbed the political ladder in Ukraine, and it may have been a movement of the heart. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, depending on how you count something like five million Ukrainians, between three and five yeah. million Ukrainians died during the Ukrainian famine in 1932-33, so <laughs> maybe he felt bad about it. Uh, just to piggyback on that, uh, going back to the Soviet Union, you had uh, Stalin, who was Georgian, you had Khrushchev and Chernyenko, who were Ukrainian. And how did that whole thing interplay between the whole Russian nationalism and the broad pan Slavic stuff? Because I never understood where the Russians stopped and the Soviet began. Um. I mean that's a, that's a very long and complicated question. Um, you, you know, it, you know, in essence, the Soviet Union had an internationalist ideology, and officially, it was a you know, internationalist state. It was a it was a it was a union of different republics, um, and you know, and it presented itself that way, and it used that kind of language. Um, in practice, uh, the Russian dominated both culturally and linguistically and politically, um, and and the Russians over time certainly over the period of the Soviet Union, came to see Ukraine as an integral part of the country. They have, Russians to this day, all Russians, have trouble seeing Ukraine as a foreign country, although Ukrainians think of themselves that way. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because this question of nationalism in the Soviet Union was one that, I have a friend who teaches uh, Ukrainian history at Harvard, who I was talking to yesterday, who reminded me that in, until the, um, until the, uh, 19, uh, until the 19, late 1980s, he proposed to write some kind of paper on national nationalism inside the Soviet Union. Everybody said, that's such a boring subject. Why would you want to do that? You know, people were interested in other things, you know, arms race and how the Kremlin was thinking about things. And he said, no, I think this nationalism issue is quite important. No, 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 that's not, that's not, that's not worth writing your PhD on or, or your paper. And then, of course, you know, the minute um, 1991 happened and people began to realize that these national republics did have separate identities and that it was actually pressure from them. It was pressure from primarily Ukraine that broke up the Soviet Union. 
um, then suddenly everybody got interested in him again. Um, but you know, one of the questions that people often ask about the end of the Cold War, my son, who stu who studies in England, where they do study the Cold War, um, was asked on an ex a final exam, who was who was the cause of the Cold, who en who ended the Cold War? Was it Gorbachev, Reagan, or Lech Wałęsa? Um, and you know, the, one of the interesting things about that question is it left out the person, the people who really may have ended the Soviet Union, which was the Ukrainians, because they pushed for independence, and de facto Ukrainian independence meant that the Soviet Union had no, I mean, without Ukraine, Russia, and a few central, and without the Baltic states, and without Georgia, um, the Soviet Union didn't really have a, you know, it wasn't really an empire anymore, and, you know, the, with, with a few Central Asian countries, it, you know, this union of states didn't really make much sense. So the, 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 Repu the Soviet republics played a big role in bringing it to an end, although Reagan mattered too. So. <laughs> Um, I wonder if, um, since part of the focus of Pioneer is on the teaching of history in our schools, if you could talk a little bit about the contrast between the way that our high school textbooks and our colleges fully cover, or at least come to grips with the, the Nazism and the Holocaust, and, and yet the rel there's a relative silence or absence, and what needs to be done to, to, to draw attention to the sheer scale of the victims of communism? And shouldn't, should that be part of our curriculum in the schools? Do you want to answer that? You're an expert on the evil empire. <laughs> well, it will, <coughs> gives me a chance to, to mention very briefly what I said just now about Ronald Reagan and the Holocaust, because it affected the younger generation in the sense that um, when he was an intelligence officer in the motion picture unit at the end of World War, Five, uh, World War II in 1945, for weeks on end he had to screen uh, the raw footage coming back from the opening of the camps recorded by our signals corps. Uh, and this horrifying, horrendous footage which he had to sit through for hours every day, he had to process and edit to send to the Pentagon. And this footage had such a traumatic effect upon him that when he was demobilized in the fall of that year, he personally stole a couple of reels to take back home with him to show to his children when each of them reached the age of 14, girls and boys alike. He said, it's the only way they'll ever understand what man is capable of doing to man. Um, he understood as early as that, that it's vital that the younger generation understand the bestiality of which human beings are capable. And uh, I think that uh, since our teachers today, um, in order to get their, uh, this is just my wild theory, in order to keep their um, teaching grades up and their statistics looking good, tend to shy away from complex, unpainful uh, subjects that might traumatize their students and teach a sanitized version of history which skitters over the unpleasantness, and the awfulness of history and just teach the good things, the bland things, the specious things. And a vast ignorance um, is developing, an amnesia that uh, Mr. Birmingham cited, and I cited myself, which is truly a national disgrace. The ignorance of our children is an indictment of our educational system. I, I just add to that the um, the, the question about re remembering the, the the Soviet past. It is better than it used to be. Um, in an odd way, since the end of the Cold War, we have, you know, the, at the very least, the the question of, you know, was the Soviet Union good or bad, and what should we, you know, and the question it has been depoliticized. In other words, it's unlinked from current politics. There's really no political argument right now about whether we should have fought the Cold War. Everybody agrees that we should have fought it. In, in, in a way, that ending of that, of the, of, the, of the political argument means that it's easier to talk about historically. It's a more neutral subject. I mean, you don't find even people on the left, maybe some crazy people on the far left, but even people on the left no longer say, you know, the Soviet Union was a good thing and, you know, we shouldn't be fighting it. So in a way, in a way there's a, it's easier to talk about now and easier to write books. There's been actually a huge number of new books on the subject, on the Cold War, on the Soviet Union, um, largely to do with the opening of archives, but also I think just the, 
depoliticization of the subject in American culture. You know, it's now, it's now a neutral historical subject. And I think it's better than it used to be. I mean, it's now in more in school curriculums than it was. I mean, <coughs> although actually what um, Edmund Morris has just said, you know, I, I think I mentioned in my, in my talk, but the, nevertheless, the lack of photographs and the lack of evidence, you know, there, it, there aren't films like the films of the Nazi camps of the Gulag. And so we don't have it in our heads in our historical memory in the same way. And the only way to bring it back is to write about it and speak about it. So. I think the phrase is memory hole. Those There's images a, went down the memory hole. They're, they're, they were never made. There, right. there is no film of the Gulag. One last quick question. One more question over here. Um, this does kind of connect with um, what we're discussing with um, trying to confront that amnesia. Um, but I'm currently discussing with my sophomores the legacy of the Korean War. And we're reading um, Escape from Camp 14, which is the story of um, a defector who was born in a North Korean um, no exit camp and was one of the only people known to escape and tell his story as someone who was never meant to leave that camp. Um, how do you think teachers can try to use the legacy of the Holocaust, the legacy of the Gulag, to talk about a very current issue, one of the longest lasting concentration camp systems, um, even when there is seemingly no outcry from kind of a leadership position on that issue in North Korea, where we continue to kind of look at North Korea as a threat to us without really focusing on the human rights crisis in We've the country themselves? You know, until Reagan, when we looked at the Soviet Union, we didn't talk about internal problems in the Soviet Union. It was actually only in the 1980s when Reagan drew the attention to the human rights issues in the Soviet Union that we, that we, that we focused on it. So that's not, that's not a new problem. I mean, I think the interesting thing to do with Korea, with North Korean camps, is to trace them, because they are actually um, identical to Stalin's gulag. They were set up with Stalinist advice, and you can look at the way there are many things in common with them. And to look at them um, as a, you know, in conjunction with the Chinese camps, you know, in, in conjunction with the, with the Soviet camps, and to see them as part of a historical tradition. You know, they belong to the same line of, of thinking and of, and of sort of human behavior. Um, that, that helps them, makes them make sense. May I say that if you're troubled by the memory hole as regards the gulag in teaching your students, I don't know if Anne will agree with this, but it might be a way of appealing to their imagination. I guess Solzhenitsyn's novels are too massive, but if they could uh, be taught to read uh, the short stories of Valan Shamalov, mm -hmm. Kalima tales, the full horror of the gulag is encapsulated in these yeah, and short easy to read. stories. Very, very easy short, to easy read. Short stories. And they are um, authentically uh, documentary. Thank you very much, Anne and Edmund. Thank you both very, very much. We now move on to our roundtable panel discussion. And it's my job to introduce William Taubman, who you've already been introduced to. So I'll try, try not to be redundant in my words of introduction, but William Taubman is the Bertrand Snell Professor of Political Science Emeritus at Amherst College. He's the author, as you know, of Khrushchev, The Man in His, his Era, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography in 2004 in the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography in 2003. Professor Taubman has written and contributed on numerous books about political leadership of the Soviet Union, including Nikita Khrushchev, with which he was co-editor with Sergei Khrushchev, and Abbott Gleason. Khrushchev on Khrushchev, he was the editor and translator with Sergei Khrushchev, who's the son of, of Nikita. Moscow Spring co-authored with Jane Taubman, his wife, in Stalin's American policy from Entente to Detente to Cold War in 1982. And Mr. Taubman is the moderator of our panel.